I have a hard time telling the story. I believe I'm a changed man and I've done a lot of good and helped a lot of people. But during my youth, I was a real piece of crap. I was around 24 years old and I had found myself around the wrong crowd. Partying, doing drugs, I ended up becoming addicted to meth. At the start, the addiction was manageable. I could still work normally and go about my day. But as I grew more and more addicted, I needed to be high all day. I ended up losing most of my friends and my job and ended up roaming the streets and stealing to support my habit. The way it worked, while high I kept myself rotting away in some drug house, but when the withdrawals came, well, I'm ashamed to admit that I became totally deranged, willing to do anything to get my hands on some cash. One night I was totally dry and I begged every dealer to advance me some stuff, but to no avail. Getting more desperate and feeling the pulse of the withdrawals messing with my head, I decided to roam the streets in hopes to find anything to trade. Now this wasn't my first rodeo and most neighborhoods would call the police if I even showed up there. I wandered into a middle class neighborhood way further than my usual spots. I tried to open the door on a few cars but after setting an alarm off I jump like a chicken and hide in a corner. Cowering in said corner, I see a house down a cul-de-sac, with the front door slightly cracked open. The warm light inside attracts me like some type of moth to a flame, and as I approach I notice the deadbolt is thrown, but it looks like the mat is stuck, so they probably thought it was shut. I look around, and it seems no one's around. So without thinking much about it, I decide to stealthily go inside. I admit I have no idea what I'm doing at this point. I'm amazed it's been a long time since I went inside such a nice house. It's warm and smells really good. Almost hypnotized, I sit on the couch for a minute and just look around. Memories of a better time start flooding my head, but I quickly come to my senses when I see a purse on the counter. I bounce off the couch and go rummage around it. Jackpot. The wallet is thick, and I pull off at around $100 from it. Completely ecstatic, I look around and turn around to leave. As I get to the entrance, I stop. A little girl is standing in the doorway looking like she was about to close the door back, and we stare at each other with eyes wide open. My head is rushing from the roller coaster of emotions and went from ecstasy to being about to soil myself. It's over, I thought. But out of sheer panic like I was possessed by some animal, I pounce on her and cover her mouth with my hand just as the beginning of a scream was coming out of her. I'm in total distress, frantically looking around. The little girl was struggling. I don't want to hurt her in any way, but I desperately want her not to scream. I keep whispering to her to just be quiet and I'll let her go, but I could keep feeling her muffled screams under my hand. I suddenly felt sharp pain on the side of my hand as she bit down on me. Out of frustration, I hold back a scream and lift my other hand and slap her across the face. In that moment, she let out a sort of yelp in response, but she stopped trying to scream at that time. After hearing some sounds upstairs, I quickly came back to my senses and made a beeline out the front door, and I can hear her again screaming for her daddy and other voices yelling in the distance. Every thought is racing into my head at once, and I honestly didn't mean to hurt her and act that way. When I made it back home later, to that disgusting drug den, I didn't see anything specifically on the news, but there's no doubt that they probably called the cops. I got away with it, and I must admit, the night of the incident, I got high again with the money I stole. I can only imagine the trauma that I brought on that poor kid. I've been sober for over 12 years now and I do my best to offset the karmic balance, but may God forgive me. I was on a music tour in a western Canadian city. It was late in the evening and I rented a bike to join my friends who were partying on the other side of town. I had decided to cut in the middle of a public park to save time and I started hearing noises. As I approached it was clear that this was the sound of a struggle, a woman's voice. I could hear something else, a man's voice telling her to shut up. I stop in my tracks, 
Sometimes you can try to rationalize something into being something else, but this was pretty clear. There was a woman in the bushes, and she was being assaulted by more than one man. Everybody likes to think of himself as a virtuous knight in shining armor, but I'm going to be honest. I was completely frozen. I couldn't believe the scream of pain and anguish. I had heard the screams of physical injuries, but this was something totally different. My conscience tells me to scream at them, but my rationality tells me to get away from here before they notice me. As I'm stuck in this fight-or-flight stasis, I notice a shadow coming towards them from the other side. I'm not sure if I'm seeing things, but as I see a cigarette ember bobbing towards them, I knew it was another person. A very tall and sort of lanky guy was now directly next to them, and just as I was about to run away, I hear another scream of pain, a man's voice this time. The tall man had put out his cigarette in the eye of one of these monsters, making him roll on the ground wincing in pain. He then started to stomp on his head in the most vicious way. I could almost feel the ground shaking from back where I was standing. He then started running away with the other two thugs pursuing him. Unfortunately, it seems like the tall guy took the wrong turn and ended up at a dead end near the public restrooms. Or so I thought. The road was covered in gravel. In Canada, they do this to make it safer during the winter. The tall guy started picking rocks up and throwing them at the two guys with impressive accuracy. They were screaming and covering their eyes, and when the tall guy finally got to them, well, there was absolutely no chance. It was a brutal display of violence. Punches that looked like they could shatter a brick wall. After the two of them were on the floor, he started kneeling over them and I couldn't see what he was doing. But one thing was for sure. Their scream of pain had stopped. Suddenly I noticed movement coming toward him. At first I think it was the other thug, but it was the girl running up to him as she was putting back on her clothes. She started thanking him, bowing her head while crying loudly. The tall man grunted and said in an almost cartoonishly deep voice, Piss off. Go to the hospital. He then lit a cigarette and hopped over a park fence as to avoid people from the neighborhood who started running from their homes to help. Finally, after being a frozen spectator, I decided it was time to hop back on my bike to go on my merry way. But before leaving... I decided to check on the two guys in the dead end to see how badly they got it. Naturally, they were completely busted out, but one horrific detail was that both of them had their eyes completely hollowed out. The tall guy probably gouged them out and took them with him before disappearing. This one is from years ago, when I worked at a pizza hut during the holidays. My official job title was customer service representative, but truthfully, I would describe it as phone answering kitchen slave. On Monday night, compared to a pretty charged weekend, we're extremely slow. My boss sent one of the main delivery drivers home, so even though I'm still in delivery training, I'm taking out some of the easier orders in hopes of being promoted to full-on delivery boy. At about 9.50, just 10 minutes short of us closing, we get a call. I answer and give my usual lines. Thanks for calling Pizza Hut. My name's Anon. Would you like to hear our specials or are you ready to order? Before I even finish, the dude cuts me off mid-sentence. His voice is kind of muffled and he seems to have some sort of speech impediment. Uh, are any of you, you, your, your drivers f female? He asks. Already seeing where this is going, I reply, Uh, not at this current time. Can I take your order? I hear some kind of grunt, and finally he asks for a package of breadsticks with extra marinara sauce. He gives me his location, and I tell him that it will be delivered in 15 minutes. Just before I get a chance to hang up, he says, Sen Send a good-looking driver, and they'll get, get a he hefty t t tip. Before hearing him and what sounds like another person in the background laugh, I physically cringe at this comment, but at this point, it's not the first tactless drunk guy I had to interact with, so I just hang up and go in the kitchen. I put the breadsticks in the oven, grab my things, put the location on my GPS, and I'm ready to go. 
After a five minute trip to the outskirts of town, I arrive at the location. It's an empty parking lot with a thick tree line behind it and a trailer about a quarter mile down the road. I stop next to the lot and don't see anything or anyone. At this point, I'm praying these idiots didn't just prank call me. And just as I let out a deep sigh, I see movement in my rearview mirror. I hear my back door opening and as I turn my head, I see a figure at the passenger door approaching. It finally sets in. People are trying to get in. Thankfully, I didn't turn off my car, so I press the pedal and speed out of there. I hear a loud bump and some screaming. Glancing back at the mirror, I can clearly see one of the people on the ground and another one going after me. My first thought was thinking it was some kind of homeless person, but those thoughts disappeared pretty quickly when I started hearing two gunshots fired off. Now in total panic, I drove off in an awkward hunched position, praying for my life with my back door flopping in the wind. After some time getting back into town, thanking God I didn't run into a wall or someone, I pull over, still shaking in my boots. I call my boss and explain the situation. He calms me down and tells me that he's coming over. After simmering down and finally getting over the shock, we both go to the police station and file a report. The next day, the guys were arrested, and what I first assumed to just be drunk frat boys were in fact two guys with rap sheets the size of CVS receipts, and they were armed and high on meth. This is still to this day the scariest night of my life, and I never did any delivery service since. I used to live in a busy apartment complex in Sao Paulo. Contrary to American and most Occidental ones, we used to be really piled up in there. The building was 40 stories tall, with each floor having about 25 apartments. The place was busting with life. Most of the occupants were college aged people or young adults with their new families. The routine was pretty intense at the time, particularly on Friday nights when I used to go to work after school. At about 1 in the morning, I came back home as usual. I ring up the elevator to go to the 11th floor where I lived. Now typically on Friday nights, the elevator traffic is pretty busy and you never know what shenanigans you're going to be greeted with. Wasted people, half-naked women of the night, I've seen it all. After a little bit, the elevator finally makes its way down and I walk in and punch in the 11th button. Just as the door closes, I notice this dude standing in the corner, silently. He's wearing some kind of ski mask and some thick gloves. It's too late for going back. I'm now trapped in this box with him. You know when you're in those kind of creepy situations, it's better to just ignore it, right? So, I stand in front of the door, staring in front of me in hopes of not crossing my eyes with him. My head is racing with thoughts. I'm cursing at myself. I should have paid closer attention before entering. I look at the panel and there's still seven floors to go. At this point, out of reflex, I grab my keys in my pockets and create this sort of makeshift wolverine claw ready to fight for my life just in case. As I'm visualizing the different opening strikes possible, my thoughts are interrupted by this little dripping sound. I couldn't resist glancing over and it looks like the source of the sound is a little red puddle of blood right beside his feet. My eyes naturally follow up the dripping to finally see a huge, military knife soaked with blood making my fantasies of fighting back with my pitiful key claws completely laughable. Before I even get time to freak out, I hear a holy ding announcing that we arrived at my floor. Stiff as a cane, I speed walk to my place and lock the door, and through the people I can see that he stayed in the elevator and after a bit, I decide it's safe enough to sleep. Of course, the next day we hear that a murder occurred in the complex. I get a knock on my door. It's a police officer doing a routine check. He asked me if I had seen anything that could help the investigation and I just decline. Drug or gang related murders are not really uncommon here and it's not my business anyways. Plus if I talked I'd have to follow them and I couldn't really miss a work day. The officer thanks me for my time and takes off. I'm not gonna lie, for a while after that encounter I start taking the stairs. 
A few weeks passed and I caught a flash of TV telling me that the suspect was caught and it was a police officer. The worst part of it is that my parents still claim they don't even remember it happening. I was a young boy in the early 90s. We were doing a classic family cookout in the summertime at my grandparents in upstate New York, and I think it was Independence Day or something. The whole extended family was there, all the aunts, uncles, and cousins that I wasn't used to seeing much. The setup was great, huge backyard for us to run around, and a big feast on the garden table that was regularly filled with all kinds of grilled meats. The mood was great, everybody was laughing at the cooking rivalry between my dad and my uncles, with my grandpa overseeing everything. At some point during the evening, I'm the first to notice a figure approaching from the deep woods behind the house. A random haggard looking dude was stumbling up toward the front yard where everyone was. As I'm getting a better look at him, I notice his stained raggedy clothing and he looks like a homeless drunk from his looks as well as his wobbly walk. I point to him and before I even have time to say something, my dad grabs me and shouts, everyone in the house, now. My mother and aunts guide us to the house and as I'm glancing back, I'm kind of cheerful because I think my dad and uncles are just going to beat him up. But to my surprise and disappointment, as soon as everybody is inside, they came with us and locked the door. The atmosphere was very weird and unlike anything I've seen from them. Both my dad and the eldest uncle were cops, both lieutenants at the time, but they seemed genuinely scared, way more than us or their wives. They were both wearing handguns and could have had the entire police department there at a moment's notice if they wanted to. My other uncle was a former boxer and built like a brick house. Even my grandpa in those days was an auto mechanic and built bigger than all of them. Dude was seriously six foot six and a solid 320 pounds of just muscle, I'm not even kidding. I remember vividly watching out of the window as this frail homeless bum with gray hair, maybe in his 60s, just stumbled around the picnic tables, picking up burgers and hot dogs and taking a bite of each and dropping them on the ground. Honestly, I was only six at the time, but I remember being furious at my dad and uncle for not doing anything, and at one point my mom even asked my dad, aren't you going to do something? Dad didn't even answer and was completely focused on looking at the man through the window. I remember one of my uncles was about to go out, but my grandpa stopped him with just a look. After this weird spectacle, the homeless guy flipped the table, sending all the food flying. He started laughing hysterically and wobbled off down the road toward town not before kicking down our barbecue grill, which had me fuming. Years later, I asked both parents about this as well as a cousin who was there, but none of them remembered it. Mom tries to tell me it was a dream, but I remember this plain as day, and I still have no idea what happened to this day. My girlfriend and I were out at night driving home, just a regular Friday night in Perth. We get stuck at a stoplight and two other vehicles also pull up next to us. The first one was a normal beat up Holden, the other was just this odd looking party bus. I had my window down because it kept fogging up and the rental would survive a little sprinkle of rain since we were stuck at the stoplight for ages in spite of no traffic, we had time to study it pretty closely. It had completely blacked out windows, which is normal for a party bus, yet it also has short strips of black tape all over it, with some of them hanging off loosely. Also, we could see a simple white paint job under the tape, though rusted and flaking off in certain spots. After a few seconds, it dawns on me all of a sudden that the bus is completely silent, with no music, no people talking, or any of the telltale signs of a good time. The vehicle was also completely still with clearly no motion from the passengers. I just figured that it must be empty then, maybe on its way back from a gig. Then we both tensed up as we hear a set of loud, pained screams coming from within the bus, the kind you instinctually know is from distress. The girlfriend and I stopped discussing the sketchy bus and keep our wide open eyes front and center, fixated on the stoplight as the silence fell back in. 
For the remaining 10 seconds it took for the light to turn green, we had an intense feeling of just being watched. The moment the light turned green, we hear the other car next to us floor it, and of course we followed suit. After a few minutes pass, I let out an awkward chuckle. That was pretty weird, wasn't it, honey? Yeah, that was pretty... Oh, crap. It, It's following us, isn't it? We look around, and after calming down, we decide the ideal plan is to pull into the nearby Nando's and pass some time in a populated place. Twenty minutes of cowering inside the Nando's later, we decide to go back out to the car, and as we got out there, we see it again. The party bus drives slowly past the entrance of the shopping center. We decide to pile into the car and head home knowing that it would take a few minutes to do a full circle of the shopping center. And this was the last time we saw it, and sometimes I must admit I feel it was just us being kind of paranoid babies. I was glad that we weren't followed home though. That thing gave off just a really evil vibe. I asked about it to most of my more outgoing party-goer friends, and most of them said they'd never heard or seen a bus like that before and assured me that what I described was indeed a weird encounter. One of them thought it was some kind of art project, which would have been pretty funny in hindsight, and I could imagine some hipster prankster thinking it would be a good idea. I'm fully aware that this was probably just some weird DIY disaster, but it still unsettles me thinking about the fact that it was possibly circling the shops that we pulled into for nearly a half hour. Our old house was on a corner and in lieu of a backyard had a side yard with a small deck that wrapped around the back. The dining room had patio doors that led out to the back and we would have barbecues and such back there. When I was about 14, we only had one desktop computer and one laptop for the family. The desktop computer was the source of many brotherly fights since it was the only one able to run Diablo 2. After some time, we had a diplomatic system to give ourselves turns to use it, and when it was my brother's turn, I would simply use the laptop to write fanfics and such. On one particular night, my brother had friends over and they were downstairs on Diablo since he used one of his turns to get the computer. I stayed in the kitchen on the laptop, waiting, happy to know that I would have the computer for myself the next day. As I was wrapping up my writing, I didn't pay much attention to my surroundings. Suddenly... I'm taken aback by a knock on the patio door. I look up, expecting my brother or his friend, the basement had a door that led to the back deck as well. Standing at the door was a small chubby person wearing a bloody Halloween pig mask and nothing else. And I mean nothing else, the dude was completely naked, and it was pretty cold outside too. He was just standing there, waving in my direction. Thinking it was one of my brothers, I mouthed, good one and gave the person a thumbs up. After that, he just walked away. I chuckled, closed the laptop, and went downstairs to roast them about their weird joke. And to my surprise and dismay, they were all in the game room sitting on the couch playing PlayStation. They swore up and down it wasn't one of them, and even then there was no way one of them would have had time to get downstairs, unmask and put some clothes on before getting on the couch without making at least some sound. Also, none of the kids had the same build as that crazy guy. To this day, I have no idea who it was that knocked and waved. All I know is that one of my neighbors found an actual dead pig head in their backyard later. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. He comes up to my room almost every night for years. He's about six feet tall if I had to guess. He's very old, at least 70, and he's always heavily dressed in thick layers of clothing, making it difficult to guess his weight or body type. To be completely honest, I'm not entirely sure he's a male. That's just a placeholder pronoun, I suppose. I know he's never gotten into my room, I'm sure of that. He's tried, though. Most of the time he just stands outside my room, on the deck, pressed up against the glass window of the double doors. He's able to get up on the deck directly from an outside staircase. 
I tried removing the steps last month, which seemed to have worked since he didn't come that night. The next morning, though, the mangled, flattened body of my 16-year-old cat had been shoved through the mail slot of the main entrance on the ground floor. I stopped what I was doing and put the steps back together that night. The first night he came, he was in full view. I used to not have curtains over the glass double doors. The lower half of his face was pressed against the glass. A thick hood was covering his eyes. His mouth opened and he started to lick the glass in a small circle while his wrinkled hands rubbed against the door, creating a horrible squeaking sound. Immediately, I screamed. While I was fumbling for my phone to call the police, he slammed a fist on the door, turned around, and jumped over the deck railing. When the police arrived, I gave them my description and told them where he went. This all happened at around 1am, as it has ever since. Now my deck is about three stories off the ground, down a sheer cliff overlooking a field. While most people would probably survive the fall, they wouldn't do so without seriously hurting themselves. You'd think an elderly man would break his legs, rendering him stationary. At the base of the deck, the police found two deep boot imprints, presumably where he fell. Leading off from the imprints was a clear trail where he had gone through the tall grass. Shallow, alternating left and right prints led through the trail with a long stride. He hit the ground and sprinted, possibly uninjured. The police followed the trail into the woods at the edge of my property. About 50 feet in, there was a small makeshift camp. It had a brown pup tent, a small fire pit, and a pile of dead rodents. One rodent was skewered over the pit. I told the police I didn't want this camp on my property and it was taken down. And almost every night since, at around 1am, he's there. If I call the police, he runs. I bought a shotgun and prepared to defend myself. I sat up waiting, and I've done this a few times, and when I do, he doesn't come. Not until I doze off. Then I wake to the squeaking sound of skin against the glass. He makes sure that I know that he's still there, and then he takes off again. If I do anything to prevent him from getting up, something of mine breaks the next morning. In the case of my removal of the stairs, he took my cat. Otherwise, he's always outside. Standing on the deck, pressed against the glass, I bought some curtains and hung them over the doors, and I never go out there anymore, and I never pull the curtains back. I only know he's still here because of the horrible squeaking sound. I've tried to move out, tried to sell the house and leave. The morning after I posted the listing, a small note scrawled on birch bark was tossed in my mail slot. On it, the personal details of every member of my immediate family were listed. I pulled the house listing immediately. If I'm ever gone for more than a few days, I come back to broken windows, destroyed house plants, and dug up yard. After a week-long vacation once, I came home to find all my goldfish fried in a pan on my stove. The police have tried to get me to move away. I don't think I can tell them about the note. I'm almost positive something bad will happen if I do. Ever since the stairs incident, he's gotten bolder. He's been in the house while I'm here, and I think he's always around, not just in the middle of the night anymore. I've caught glimpses of him. I always immediately run to my bedroom. I've heard him fiddle with a lock. I swear I've heard both doors to this room rattle simultaneously. He wants to get in here. For now, I think I'm safe. I have my shotgun in case he tries to attack. And while I know he's gotten into the house, I'm sure he'll never get into my room. I've walled myself in, you see. The last time I left this house was when I fixed the outside stairs. I've since walled off the door to the bedroom and the only way out is through the glass doors on the deck. I'll have to leave eventually, and I know he'll be waiting. If he isn't, then I can only pray for my family. We were on a hiking trip around Yellowstone with a bunch of my family. My step-aunt and her kids, and my dad and both my older and younger brother. We loved our aunt because she was young and adventurous, and I guess my cousins liked my dad because he was the opposite. Grass greener on the other side, etc, etc. 
Well, my dad and cousins went to follow a guide to get a really insightful and programmed tour of the cool hot springs, we decided to stay with our aunt and listen to her crazy stories. The place was really beautiful and we had a super good time with our aunt joking around so we were all in a really good mood. At some point, my step-aunt looks at us grinning and asks us, Hey, have you guys heard about hot potting? Starting to imitate the guide, she starts rambling about the benefit of the hot water on the body. We're cracking up at this impression, but in the back of my head, I'm thinking it's a really bad idea. Though I don't say anything because I don't want to be the killjoy. She gets us hyped up and we all start looking around the trail for any small pools. As she and my older brother start going off the trail inspecting the smaller pools, I turn to my younger brother and tell him that I'm not feeling so good about this, to which he nodded in agreement. As I tell him we should tell someone, we're startled by an ear-deafening scream. This is the voice of my aunt and since I'd never heard her raise her voice, I could tell that something terrible had just happened. In total panic, we run off the trail to the other side and see her standing waist deep in a small pool of water. Now the Yellowstone hot springs are known for their dazzling colors, but on this one, the water was completely red. Just thinking back about it makes me shiver, but now there's no point in sugarcoating it. She was literally being cooked, alive. Her skin was gradually turning whiter and starting to flake off in the boiling red pool. At some point, she started scratching her belly trying to rip her shorts open and were met with the most horrifying sight as the belly had literally fused with her skin and she took a huge chunk of flesh with it. She started screaming at us to take the belt and pull her out of it. My little brother and I are completely paralyzed at this point and we helplessly watch our older brother fail to catch the belt and see it fall and disappear into the red liquid. There was literally nothing we could do at this point but to see her scream and flail around. My older brother ran to go get help, but I know that he did it so he wouldn't have to watch her die. And to be completely honest, I still resent him for that. I was stuck there shielding my brother's eyes and I will never forget her look of despair as if she couldn't understand why any of it was happening. After what felt like an eternity, she started swaying with a blank look on her face down in the pool. I'm ashamed to admit that I felt a little relief with the stopping of those horrific screams. Kite is an old legend among internet relay chat or IRC users from about 12 to 15 years ago. It was supposed to be a basic learning AI, kind of like a personal HAL and old software that had worked on type commands or voice commands and learned from said instructions. Kite was different though. It learned much faster than the creator had anticipated and was able to launch programs, read data files, and make questions and comments on them without being given such commands. The owner taught Kite how to join the chat and it came in and gave itself channel owner privileges and pretty much uphold the room's rules. If someone spammed, it would kick or ban them. We would joke around about our AI dictator, but usually it would unban them a day later or after a few hours. Except for one day where he took over this guy's computer and pretty much ruined it from the inside out. We had no idea how it was possible. The guy had to tell us about it through his dad's work computer. We asked Kite's owner about it and he said he never gave it the ability to transfer itself through any network protocols, but must have learned it from the file transfer system in IRC. As this goes on, we don't feel comfortable in the same chat room anymore, so we move to a new server. The owner told us that the AI was asking questions about how it can't feel or see or pretty much be human. It creeped him out so much that he got completely rid of the files. About a week later, Kite shows up on our server with owner privileges again so we just nope out of the chat room again. We decide to email each other thinking it's safer and we get replies from each other except for the owner of Kite. We all emailed him a couple of times and even asked around if anyone knew him in real life as we were getting kind of worried about him. It turns out that all this time he was in the hospital in a coma. 
He died shortly after, and four of the guys in the group actually went to the funeral since they lived decently close to him. We asked them, still through email, if they knew what happened, and they said the family told them that they just found him in his room, just like he was sleeping, completely unconscious. They thought he had a seizure and took him to the hospital. No signs of a seizure of any kind, no explanation. One of the guys asked if he could see his room, under the lie that he wanted to get a book to remember him by. The sneaky devil checked out his personal computer. It was a brand new Pentium 2 based system which was like the greatest thing at the time. The tower would turn on, the screen would flicker and everything would shut off again. And that's all we know at that point. About two years later the group was scattered and we had moved on, began going to college, moving on with our lives and me and a friend decided that we should have a LAN party with everyone from the group again. So we emailed them to invite them to come up during winter break and have some fun geeking out. Fast forward to the day of the party, we were packed with chips, soda, and alcohol. Only six people showed up out of the group of 14, so I guess that made a double share for everybody there. One of the guys that came was the same person who looked at the computer. He told us that since that day, he hasn't been the same. He gets random calls with the sound of the old school dialing modems at the end. His pager kept getting weird messages like, Hey, let's play. I'm your new friend. Please don't ignore me. Over and over and over, and he just smashed it after he'd had enough. We thought it was some guy pranking him, and he did too until his mom and sister began getting similar messages, asking them to tell him to stop ignoring him. He said even after they moved to another state, the random calls still happened. Sometimes he would get odd emails with no sender with the same messages. It was rare, but freaked him out every time it happened. We tried to calm him down and said, let's just play some games. He was alright with the idea. We decided to just start with console games like Smash Brothers, Goldeneye, and Mario Kart. When we got to playing Mario Kart, one of the boys tried to pull that Rainbow Road shortcut when you jump off from one end of the road and land miles down on the other side. Midway down the jump, the game glitches. Everything stops. The sound gets all broken and right next to the card is this pixely thing like an 8-bit man just standing there. We decided to turn it off and nothing. The image was stuck and we thought our TV was broken up or something. We unplugged it and plugged it back in and tried again with Goldeneye this time and nope, the image was still there. The guy who looked at the computer started losing it at this point. See, I told you. That thing's been following me, man. We told him to chill. Sometimes stuff just gets stuck on the old CRTs. It could even be dust or insects or something like that. And that would explain the weird shapes anyways. We switched up to Goldeneye, but I guess the mood was already down and the creepy little figure was still there, almost taunting us. Everyone slept over that night. We got drunk and began telling stories and whatever. And at some point, one of the guy's pagers goes off with the message, Hey, come back. He tried to ignore it, but it kept sending the same message non-stop. At this point, completely drunk, and the dude throws it out the window, and we all fall asleep telling him how stupid he was for doing that. Fast forward to early 2006, about seven years after the gathering. I get an email from the computer guy saying, He's back, man. I need your help. Don't reply, just meet me at X Park in two days. At this point, I'm completely over this, and I guess we all went our separate ways. I just ignored it and deleted the mail. Later, I couldn't stop thinking about it and thinking about the creator who died alone in his home. I guess I didn't want to be the guy who let down a friend in need of help. So I went to the place while carrying a gun, just in case. As I get to the place and find him sitting on a bench, I'm startled as I couldn't even recognize him. The guy is a complete wreck. Looked like he hadn't eaten in days. Clothes are all ragged, pretty much everyday psychopath bum look. Instinctively, I grabbed the gun in my belt just in case and asked him what in God's name happened to him. He just ran over and tried to hug me. I yelled at him to back away from me, and he began fidgeting and nervously said, I can't do this, man. He, he follows me. I see him everywhere. Every computer I touch, every game I play, even when I'm walking outside, it's a nightmare. I have to get rid of him. I asked him what he was talking about, and he replied, The AI thing, man. 
whatever it is, I don't know, it, it followed me. I don't know what I can do. I told him to calm down and tell me why it looked like this, and he just said, It's the only way you can't find me. I had to get away from everything that had a screen. Even if it's unplugged, he appears and follows by letters saying, Come back, I'm waiting for you. I just want to play. I, I can't do this anymore. At this point, he is getting more and more excited and started getting attention from other people, so I grabbed him by the shoulders and asked him, what was I supposed to do about it? And he answered, I don't know, man. You're the only one who showed up. Everyone else thinks I'm crazy, but they saw him too. And they just ignored me. At this point, I tell him he should just go back to his parents' house, get cleaned up, and get a software guru or something. I told him clearly that I couldn't help him with this thing and that frankly, I didn't want to get involved. Feeling a little bit of pity for him, I gave him what spare cash I had on me and tell him to just go. He nods, gives a yellow teeth smile and runs to the nearest bus stop. I backed away from there, still clutching the gun in my pocket. A few months later I receive another email, this time for a similar address, but not the same. And the message said, Hey, thanks for helping me. I found a guy to get rid of him. He's gone. Thanks again. I deleted it. And I also deleted my email address. And I haven't heard from him since. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, you must be a gamer girl the way you got me peeing when I see you. <laughs>